Hi, welcome back to Dr. Donovan Medicine Made Easy. In today's video, we're going to hear some sounds of children who've got bronchiolitis, which I hope is going to be helpful as we're coming into the winter months and will help you to spot children who might have this illness. But before we listen to these sounds, let's cover some important basic information so that you've got a good baseline understanding of what bronchiolitis is, which will hopefully make you much more confident in terms of both diagnosing it as well as managing it. So in the first section of this video, we're going to be covering what bronchiolitis is, what causes bronchiolitis, we'll discuss which children are at risk of it, and we'll talk briefly about symptoms. We'll then listen to some sounds of children who have bronchiolitis, so it'll hopefully help you pick up some classical sounds that are associated with this illness. And then we'll talk briefly about the management of bronchiolitis. If you're a healthcare professional, such as a medical student or a GP, you might want to stick around until the very end of this video, because I've included some self-assessment questions for you to test your knowledge, and then I've also included the answers to these in the description box beneath the video. So what is bronchiolitis? Well, it's a common lower respiratory tract infection affecting babies and young children who are usually under the age of two. It's most common in babies who are aged between three and six months. And in the UK, it's most typically seen between September and April. If you break down the word bronchiolitis, it does simply what it says on the tin. The first bit of the word bronchioles are the small air-filled sacs of the lung. And the last bit of the word itis simply means inflammation. So if you put the two together, it literally means inflammation and swelling of the small airways or bronchioles. So what causes bronchiolitis? Well, the most common cause of bronchiolitis is a virus called RSV, which is shorthand for respiratory syncytial virus. At first, the virus causes an infection of the upper airway tract, and so this includes things such as the nose, the mouth, and the throat. It then spreads down the windpipe, which is known as the trachea, and it goes into the lungs, which is the lower respiratory tract. The virus usually causes inflammation, and it can all even cause death of cells, and those block airflow in and out of the child's lungs. So now that we know a little bit about bronchiolitis, what are the symptoms? Well, the early symptoms of bronchiolitis are similar to those of a common cold, such as a runny nose and a cough. Further symptoms then usually develop over the next few days, and these include things such as a high temperature, a dry and persistent cough, difficulty feeding, rapid or noisy breathing, which can be heard as wheezing, and when you listen to the chest with a stethoscope, you might hear crackles. So now that I've told you about some of those sounds, why don't we go ahead and have a listen to some sounds of children who have clinical bronchiolitis. So now that you've heard a little bit about bronchiolitis as well as what causes it and the symptoms and the sounds associated with it, well how do you manage bronchiolitis? Well treatment's going to depend on the child's symptoms, the age and their general health. It will also depend on how severe the bronchiolitis is. Thankfully most cases are mild and they can be treated at home and antibiotics aren't usually used unless the child has got a bacterial infection because antibiotics don't work against viruses and if you remember at the very beginning of this video I said that most cases of bronchiolitis are down to the virus RSV, so respiratory syncytiovirus. If children are hypoxic or low in oxygen, they may need to be admitted to hospital. And if they're not feeding properly because they're using up all that extra energy to breathe, they might need admitting to hospital for some feeding support. When they get to hospital, the medical team will assess them and the treatment options they can offer will depend on the state of the child. And these can things such as IV fluids, if the fluid intake isn't enough, they can get extra oxygen to help them with their breathing if they've got low oxygen levels. They can get frequent suctioning of the child's nose and mouth to get rid of those extra thick mucus secretions. 
If the child is well enough to be managed at home, then you might want to suggest to mum, dad or the guardians that they give the child plenty of fluids, they use simple over-the-counter medicines to control any fever that the child might have. However, it's important to try to avoid aspirin because this can cause something called Ray syndrome, which although rare can be serious. And you could also think of things such as a cool mist vaporizer in the child's room at night. It's worth safety netting the parents to watch out for things such as very fast breathing or nasal flaring or, or chest recession where the chest is being sucked in or anything that makes it look like the child is really working hard to breathe or is struggling to breathe as well as things such as reduced urine output which could be dry nappies. If they're getting any of these things then it could be a sign that the child is struggling to manage at home and they need to seek urgent medical attention. Usually when I safety net, I give mum and dad verbal advice, so I tell them to watch out for these certain things. And I also like to give them a physical copy of written safety netting information with some key points, which can usually be found if you just look at a reliable child health website. This is really good because often, if you think about it, mum and dad can be worked up and anxious, understandably so and they may not take in all the verbal information you're giving them. So having both forms of information, both verbal as well as written for them to refer back to at a later date can be really, really helpful. And you can try and encourage them to share it with their friends because they may have friends who've got young children and spreading that information is a great form of medical education in the community. I hope you found the video useful. I hope you found listening to the sounds really useful. And if you've got any comments or feedback, I'd really like to hear from you. So please leave comments in the section below. Um, once again, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. And until next time, bye.